naturally occurring timeless awareness, the true nature of phenomena is boundless. Analogies are used so that it can be ascertained through metaphor, underlying meaning, and evidence. Equal to space, that nature which subsumes everything and is without differentiation or exclusion, is exemplified by these three linking factors. In the womb of basic space, a supremely spacious state of equalness, everything is timelessly equal. This is the enlightened intent of Samantabhadra, or of Vajrasattva. Awakened mind can be compared to the sun. It is utterly lucid by nature and forever uncompounded. With nothing to obscure it, it is unobstructed and spontaneously present. Without elaboration, it is the scope of the true nature of phenomena, which does not entail concepts. In being empty, it is dharmakaya. In being lucid, it is sambhogakaya. And in being radiant, it is nirmanakaya. The three kayas do not come together or separate. Since these enlightened qualities are already and forever spontaneously present, they are not obscured by the darkness of flaws and faults. They are identical in being, without transition or change, throughout the three times, identical in permeating all Buddhas and ordinary beings alike. This is called naturally occurring awakened mind. Alrighty, just saying hello to everybody out there in the TV land. Long Chen Rob Jom, Long Chempa, the precious treasury of the basic space of phenomena. So we do understand that in our Chid practice, which I've also discussed at length and will be discussing in a future work, I'm, I'm working through that, no pun intended. I'm just naturally funny, as you can tell. But hey, as they used to say, looks aren't everything. So we want to aspire to enlightenment. We've got to understand that there's a way to be free, to transcend the... What are we transcending? We're transcending the realm of suffering. We're transcending our suffering. And it's, you know, if we're getting clean and sober and we're jumping into recovery and, you know, looking at the looking at the suffering of our past and our addiction history and so forth and prior to that and what have you, now this is one, this is one kind of suffering. But to understand that even when we're clean and sober, even after we've, say, worked 12 steps or done some therapy, doing well, you know, haven't used in a long time, got a new job, etc., whatever it is that you feel that aspiring to gives you a feeling of quality and success and stability in your, in, say, in your relationship to sobriety, in your relationship, in your relationship to your recovery. I think that's better put. So we have to understand that there's something to transcend and there's a possibility there. And in the 12 steps, as we know, you know, we seek progress, not perfection, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, spiritual awakening, which is a kindergarten, et cetera. Well, the Bodhisattva path is, is not the kindergarten. It's not the grammar school, the middle school. It's not the high school. It's not undergrad. It's not a graduate. It's not post-grad. It's post-post-grad. Post all of it. It's pre and post. It's neither pre nor post. So in our chit practice, we know that our main attachment is to the physical, so we visualize ourselves inviting all of the uh, beings, you know, holy beings, enlightened beings, guardians, protectors, uh, angels, demons, everybody that we've ever uh, incurred a karmic debt with in throughout our time, throughout time without beginning. What needs there to mention external objects? Well, I mean, if we're letting go of the ultimate attachment of the body, hack it up, put it in a bowl, let it get cooked up, frothy, spilling over, purify it with omahum, get it lit, get it pure, spread it out, let everybody come get their, get their, however they want it served and whatever amount or capacity until they're satisfied. And you want to make sure that the amends is done. You want to make sure the amends is done, son, so you have a sense of completion in the Chid practice, you know, to to manifest the practice. And we really have a sense of having canceled all those karmic debts and then turned those those beings karmically into, you know, having the potential to go on the path of Dharma and and, and seek it this or aspire to seek this enlightenment that we're doing now, you see. So it's kind of a chain reaction. So it's a very much paying it forward, but not forward or backward. It's just every every direction or directionless. So and this if this is the case, why do you why even think about why why even entertain a thought of any material object? Anything external from oneself, like 
Why even worry about it? Like, why even mention it? Why even acknowledge or notice it? We already know there's no self and there's no external to self. Now, here's the deep one. Take an inhale. Exhale. Pause on the exhale. Remain in empty space. Pause this recording if you need to and do it a few times. Do it a while. Don't hyperventilate. Just get yourself in that relaxed prana, empty Thoughts subside, just drift for a moment, hanging in the empty space. And we notice that space, it's very delicate. We don't mess around with that. We don't try to grab it, figure it out, ascertain it, push it away, put it in a box, repackage it, market it, and sell it as some non-dual bullshit making money with your elitist uh, pseudo-spiritual pop cockery. God, I hope that's a word because I, I, I just want to say it again. In your spiritual pop cockery, okay? We're not doing pop cockery up in here, my bitches, okay? So, therefore, with no hope of reward or benefit. So, it's like you've seen all these, like, you know, catchy, no hope, no fear, you know, for decades. I mean, all these things. Spiritual gangster. And it's really easy to mouth the fucking words, people. I have almost zero patience for automatons who think that they've achieved something by mouthing words. And you can see them everywhere you look. You got to look for the real deal, people. Now, what we're talking about here uh, on that tip is no hope, no fear. How do you get there? Inhale, exhale, and you got to let it linger. You got to let it linger until it's just empty. Just let that exhale go, baby. And then you just hear nothing. You just imagine. Who is it that's looking? So we have no difference between the space inside and the space, quote unquote, out there. So why would one even mention an external object? You're going into some pretty deep layers here into this practice number 25. But I'm coming at it from this perspective. And if you listened to Igor the other day, a couple of episodes back, I hope you listened to Igor. If not, go back to that episode. It was like 66, I think. Took a break from the Bodhisattva practices for a moment to give you a, a legit instruction by a Dzogchen instructor. And I encourage you to follow Igor and go find his stuff. He's teaching these things and he's on YouTube and all that info is in the show notes. If you don't know, oh my God, did I never mention this? podcast.compassionaterecovery.us That's podcast.compassionaterecovery.us because that is our witchamajinger, the site for the podcast now. And if you go to the 12stepbuddhist.com it redirects to Compassionate Recovery because I haven't recaptured and rebuilt the 12-step Buddhist. So that's how that's working right now. So it says here, to just to finish this up, therefore with no hope of reward or benefit, to give with generosity is the practice of a bodhisattva. So what what kind of gener what what kind of quality? Just pause a minute. Go write this down. Go work on this. You know, work on it with a group. Work on it in your meditation. Bring it to your meditation circle, wherever that may be. What kind of quality of generosity would one aspire to have to be at the level of not having attachment to any hope, not wishing for anything or any kind of benefit? To give with utter, absolute, limitless generosity is their practice of a bodhisattva. And this is what we aspire to. This is what we try to cultivate in our aspiration. And that's the beginning. Like, hey, I'm me. I'm meditating. They're talking about compassion. I don't feel shit. You know, I'm worried about me. I got enough of my own problems. You know, I feel numb. I mean, you're, I'm jacked up in the first couple of years of sobriety. Maybe it takes you a while to get yourself toned. You know, not toned down, but allow yourself to settle in such a way. And that's why recovery now is so much better. Everybody's doing mindfulness everywhere now. And it was not a thing when I got sober in 84. It wasn't a thing. I did it, though, myself, because it's step 11, but, you know, I was among the rare people doing it at that time. So, I mean, now it's really big. So, we're working on these things and we're working on these meditations. Okay, so I want to talk to you about amends here, all right? So, let's talk about what they're not. 
you know, with the popularization of sobriety, it's easy, easy to dilute and water things down into some idea that, well, Jimi Hendrix had the amazing and greatest album, Are You Experienced? If you're experienced in recovery, you know the difference between making it right or amending and giving yourself some or giving somebody some gratuitous apology. So I have an excellent example of this that blew my mind. I was watching Reboot on Hulu with Johnny Knoxville, who is already in recovery. And he was on Howard talking about this show. And I thought, well, I'll give it a, I'll give it a go here. And it's just a very brilliant, well-written show, well-acted. This is an example. So when we're talking from experience, it's very different than when we have some some depth and some seasoning and we've let the broth bubble for a while. You know, we want to intellectually grab things and make them work for us with our thoughts. And you know, it's usually a matter of letting go. Absolutely. And whatever it takes to let go. All right, so... Just to set this up, it's Season 1, Episode 6 of Reboot, copyright Hulu.com, and this is around 18 minutes and 32 seconds, and it's a clip where Johnny Knoxville is hanging from his balls by some ropes after doing a flying uh, scene on in front of a green screen. And the director, whom he had tried to make amends to earlier, well, he didn't actually try to make amends, he apologized. He has this cursory notion, this non-experiential, this weak notion, maybe this popularized, watered-down, sanitized notion of, oh, you got to go apologize to everybody, don't you? And you can't really tell somebody what it's like to be an addict. If you're an addict, they don't get why you do what you do. And you can't really tell somebody how you know vanilla ice cream tastes unless they taste vanilla ice cream or unless they have the experience of spiritual, you know, spiritual experience, you know, which gives us our, you know, our seasoning, you know, a little bit of taste to what we're doing. Anyway, so without further ado, we'll check out this clip. So you're telling me I've always been able to fly? Yep. I'd have been nice to know when I fell off the roof last week. Laugh, laugh, laugh. I didn't ask to be in your dream. I'm going back to my dream, where I was riding tigers with Zendaya. Oh. And as Jake ruminates in his dreamscape face to face with the specter of his own mortality, we cut. Oh. Okay, great. You guys let me down? Actually, uh, leave leave him up there for a bit. Ha, ha, ha. Ha, ha, very funny. Seriously, this thing's starting to floss my crotch and not in a good way. Since you mentioned it, I've been thinking about season three. There was an episode that year when Jake's father passed away. It was the best goddamn script Gordon ever wrote, touching as hell. And I thought it would be my one chance to win an Emmy. Well, you were so out of it, you could barely finish a scene. Well, you probably would have lost to Frazier anyway. Still a smartass. Jesus, Jerry, I already apologized. Allow me to give you a little direction. If you're playing an apology, at least try to pretend you fucking mean it. It's one thing to be young and drunk and stupid, but you're a middle-aged man. So when you mumble some insincere, perfunctory words just so you can cross my name off a list? Well, that's just insulting. So I'm sorry, I don't accept your bullshit apology. See? That was sincere. This is a far cry from going to someone and saying, hey, um, I wronged you. You know, not you don't even have to say, you know, I'm in recovery and we have this program, we have these steps and I have to do this. It's not really what it's about. You know, it's about you facing your reality and making it right somehow. I have, I'm not pure as a whistle. I've, there was a lot of amends I could make that I, that I haven't been able to. There's financial amends I can't make and that sort of thing. So we'll talk about the insurmountable odds of actually completing your actual, your real amends list in a moment. But, you know, the right way to make an amends is to go up and, and say, as I was taught, is to tell the person, I've, I've harmed you, and here's how I've, I've seen that I've harmed you, and I, I, I need to make it right with you to your satisfaction. And so I just want to give you the opportunity 
to uh, let me know if I've got it right. Have I harmed you in other ways that I'm not aware of? And, and so that I can, you know, put that into here to correct with you. Okay. To work on, um, and, and how I've affected you and, you know, and tell me what I can do, please, if anything, if there's anything that I can do to, to make this right, because I will set on that course. And that's how you make a fucking AA amends, right? And, and that's, that's your hardcore amends. That's not your bullshit amends, right? So from this experience, I say this from experience, I know this. You know, so the thing is in a Bodhisattva path, well, what are we going to get? Let's look at it from a Dharma perspective as we've been discussing and from the beginning of the podcast ever to this episode. We're looking at the aspiration of enlightenment, the aspiration of compassion or bodhicitta in Sanskrit, the aspiration being into the cultivation, into the development, into the liberation from the relative, into the absolute, into the non-dual, but the not the non-dual of the BS version. Not the non-dual of the, ooh, I had a little peek, and in my experience, I was floating above the world, and I saw my dick, and it was 15 inches long. No, it was actually 100 feet high. You know, whatever your ego wants to tell you. Um, but real masters and real teachings give you, you know, the actual straight dope. All right, so what we want to do is really come to a place of understanding that we have really committed ultimate atrocities throughout beginning of those lifetimes. Just the, it, just the feeling of it. You don't have to visualize it. You don't have to think of the words. Just know it. You already know it. How far back does your consciousness go in quote-unquote time? In relative space. How many negative actions do we accumulate moment by moment? You know, Rubina would say in every step we take. Every time we gulp. There's infinite karmic seeds planted throughout beginningless time. And if we can come to an understanding of this, great. It takes a long time to come to that understanding. If we can have an experience of letting go completely, have an inhale, have an exhale. It's nice to let go. But this is not just a superficial, psychological BS, something you're going to get from your quote-unquote, you know, hundred dollar weekend workshop mindfulness teacher etc okay you're not getting the watered down diluted stuff you know so what this is is as we exhale we remain empty this goes into deep you know tantric energy practices where we completely let go of all clinging and we allow ourselves to float in infinite space as we exhale and let go you can give yourself a little squeeze in the belly a little squeeze in the sides and just go and without any tension in the throat or the belly, just let it hang. And then just relax completely. Let your eyes fix at a point in space, but not at a thing. And notice and know the groundless ground. Know the fruitlessness of all activities in samsara. Understand the Four Noble Truths. Do you understand them on an experiential level to the point where you want to really practice no matter what arises in any kind of crazy, emotional, chaos, turbulent, emergency, egocentric response to everything? Yeah, me either, bro. So, you know, we got to be on the path. we got Dharma, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. we got to hang out together. Okay, so to sum this whole episode together, to put yourself in the aspect of the Bodhisattva is to understand the accumulation is beyond any calculation. There's no way to record it all. It's all recorded karmically. There's no way to make a list. It would be on a piece of paper from here to the moon. You know, stack pieces of paper from here to a hundred million trillion light years away. We couldn't. There's no end to it. Think about the end and try to find the end. And when you can't find it, just hang there for a moment and notice, notice, then jump back. Hey! Who's looking? Who's looking? All right, good looking. It's you that's looking, but who's the you? I don't know. It ain't there. Never found it myself, no matter how I tried to fight for it and defend it. That being said, we're coming to the end of this episode. Please get a copy of The 12 Step Buddhist on Amazon, through your bookseller, through Barnes & Noble. Compassionate Recovery, Mindful Healing for Trauma and Addictions. If you're a treatment provider, contact me. I will send you a free copy of the hard uh, printed you know, paper, not digital. Get with me. And I'll get with you. All right, everybody. Until then.
As always, peace out and namaste.